Good evening. It's good to see those that are back tonight to to worship here. Mindful of those, of course, that are not with us. We have some for various reasons who are not, some who are sick, some who are home recovering. Mindful of those and praying for them, some who are traveling, also praying for them as well. Good to see you. If you're visiting with us, thank you for being here with us tonight and those also online worshiping with us tonight. If you want to use your book, I was not told if it'll be on PowerPoint. I assume it may be. Our first song tonight will be 205. Charles Nash will lead our singing when we begin. 205 will be our first song. Jill Nash, Charles told me, is doing very well, home recovering. David Nash is still trying to recover from shingles. He's had it for a while, so continue to remember David Nash and all of his um, health issues in your prayers. Again, the bulletin is full of individuals who are recovering, whether they're at home or whether they're able to get out and about and still recover. That's always great news. Larry Fields, Mackenzie O'Brien, David Riley is battling a, a bad cold, according to the, the bulletin and respiratory issues. Uh, Joe Ruffer and Tom Durden Sr., uh, all uh, home, recovering, and all, all sounds great. Continue to remember those individuals in prayer. Events to remember and to, to put on your calendar, Mark 16th is a silver wing trip to the Booth Museum and lunch. Sign up today, and I saw some who were signing up, and if you have not yet done that, make sure that you do so. March the 23rd, Camp Inagahee 5K and Fun Run. Such a great, um, great camp. Support it in any way you can. If you love to run, make sure that you sign up and attend that 5K. Also that weekend, the 22nd through the 24th, is a youth event called SOAR. That stands for Seeking Our Awesome Redeemer. It's in uh, Augusta, Georgia, and we plan to take as many of our uh, 6th through 12th graders that want to go and parents if they want to go to that. Let me know tonight if you want to attend that, and we will get you registered and have a great time that weekend for that uh, trip. March 17th, Teen Sing at the Bolshevis, uh, immediately following Worship here on Sunday night. Girls bring chips or dessert, one of the other, and boys bring a drink item to help supply food for the singing. And also on the same night, our frogs, which is fifth grade and down, our frog group will have a frog family night uh, in the fellowship hall following worship that night. April uh, 19th through the 21st, don't forget, and we are Doing a lot to prepare for Lads to Leaders, and that's always an exciting event each year. Several other uh, announcements and events, some of them are all the way in April and May that we're not going to announce, but just consult the bulletin for uh, upcoming events, area-wide events uh, to attend. I was also asked to announce by Eric Hagen that teachers are needed for Bible class. Uh, we need teachers. Maybe you've never taught before uh, and you're thinking about teaching and we need you. We need teachers. Maybe you have taught before, but it's been several years. We need you again. We need teachers. He said we need teachers of all ages. We need teachers on Wednesday night, Sunday night. We just need teachers. Let him know if there's any interest in teaching and he will put you in a place and we would appreciate that. We're going to begin at this time with uh, 205. Number 205, as we begin our song service, we'll sing the first, third, and last verse of 205. <laughs>
562. Hymn number 562. We'll sing the first and second verse. 562. Sing to the strength. Father, we come to you tonight thanking you for all your many blessings. We thank you, Father, for this day in which we have opportunity to worship your Son. We ask you, Father, to be with all those that have been mentioned on our sick list. Give them your special healing that only you can do. We ask you tonight, Father, to be with our soldiers, our policemen, and our first responders as they keep us safe. We ask thee, Father, to be with us now as we go through the future days you've allotted us. We ask you to be with us and guide us and forgive us of our sins. We thank you especially, Father, for your son, Jesus. We ask you to be with our preachers and our elders and our... Thank you for all this. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. this time, if you'd like, please mark in your hymn books number 739. Hymn number 739 will be our invitation hymn after this evening's message. 739. After you've got that mark, turn back number 716. 716. Now I've got to ask, if it's convenient for you, would you please stand with me? 716.
Leonardo da Vinci once said, supposedly, I didn't ask him, but uh, allegedly he once said, the greatest deception men suffer is their own opinions. Now you might take issue with the truth of that statement. Maybe it could be argued one way or another whether or not that's actually true. But the statement highlights an undeniable fact. Every one of us has an opinion about something. And most of us have opinions about everything. It might be sports, whether it's Georgia or Georgia Tech, or if you're from that other place over to the west, Alabama or Auburn. It might be about politics this party or that party. It might be about automobiles, Ford, GM, or Chrysler, or in the 21st century, uh, Lexus, Acura, or, or whatever the other one is, Infinity. We all have opinions. We have some kind of thought on pretty much any subject. And those views are generally pretty harmless, aren't they? Until they find their way into the realm of Christianity. Some of us prefer green carpet in the church building. Others of us prefer red carpet in the church building. Some of us would rather have the Lord's Supper before the sermon. Others would rather have it after the sermon. Some of us would like to sing 10 songs in the worship service, and others would like to sing two. God has given us a measure of leniency in matters of opinion and matters of judgment. Paul wrote about exactly those kinds of matters in Romans chapter 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. But that leniency, that give, that that do what you please can only go and must only go so far. There are some principles found within the scriptures that should govern my opinions and yours. Let's take note of a few of them tonight. First, I have a responsibility. We all have a responsibility to distinguish between what are actually matters of opinion, what I think about something, and matters of doctrine, what God says about something. Sometimes a person is going to hold fast, cling, and and, and hang on to an opinion because they just assume that it's a matter of doctrine. It's always been this way and so it must be in the Bible somewhere. But we need to look at the example of the Berean Jews. Take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 17. The scriptures won't be on the screen tonight so pull out your phone and boot up your Bible program or your iPad or your tablet or whatever, or if you have one of these things, get it out. And look at Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, the apostle Paul had come to Thessalonica, which is a city in Greece. He'd gone to the synagogue there because that was a ready-made audience for somebody interested in God. And he wasn't very well received there. In fact, 
they pretty well threw him out of town. You look at verse 10, it says, The brethren there immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night to Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. So they go from Thessalonica to Berea, and they go to the synagogue to the Jewish community in Berea, and notice what it says in verse 11. These, that is those Jews in Berea, were more noble. If you have a a newer translation, it probably says they were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. You see, the example of the Berean Jews shows that, that we ought to search the scriptures to see if our opinion actually is a matter of doctrine. We've always done it this way. It must be what God instituted. Well, how do we know if it is or it's not? Look there and see. Sometimes the question is, is, is then put forward, well, how can I tell the difference between the two? If I'm supposed to distinguish Matters of opinion from matters of doctrine, how do I tell the difference? Well, that's actually a a question of whether or not we're actually using a a proper, a valid hermeneutic, which is the the principles that we use to interpret and understand the Scripture, to see how God has, dare we say, legislated. See what God has to say on the subject. Turn the page there in your Bible to Acts chapter 20. Maybe you'll have to go two pages. And notice in Acts chapter 20... At verse 7 we read, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart, preached unto them and continued his message until midnight. He spoke to them and continued until midnight. Well, what do we draw out of that? The disciples were gathered It was the first day of the week. They had come together to break bread. And in the biblical context, that's not usually a reference to a common meal, but to the Lord's Supper. We do that in worship, don't we? And Paul preached to them, spoke to them, spoke a long time, seemingly. What do we infer from that? What what implication is there? They did that. We should do that. That's what we get out of that passage. They're an example for us. But notice what Acts chapter 20 verse 7 does not say. It doesn't say anything at all about the time of day they began. You know, we we look at that and we read, he preached until midnight. And what do we think of? Oh my goodness. They started at 9 o'clock. Man, they missed lunch. They missed supper. That's a long sermon. Well, I'm glad we don't have sermons that long now. How long did Paul preach? I don't know. What time did they start? I don't know. The passage doesn't say anything about what time of day they began, does it? It doesn't establish a... joke about it sometimes it doesn't establish a scriptural time to begin it doesn't even say anything about a particular place does it where did they meet for worship why they went to the church house Uh, newsflash there's nothing there about a church building is there well did they sit on pews or folding chairs doesn't say Were they upholstered or were they hard? I don't know. What does it tell us? It tells us that on the first day of the week, the disciples gathered to worship. That's the instruction. That's the example there. By following the example of Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, What we learn is simply that worshiping on Sunday is a matter of doctrine. That's the example that God has given us. But the time, the place for worship, 
whether it's in the morning or the evening, whether it's in the, the church building or somebody's house or in a public square, those things are all matters of opinion because it doesn't speak to the subject at all. So I need to distinguish. I need to recognize the difference between something God has said, a matter of doctrine, and something that we have decided, a matter of opinion. God's word stands. Ours might change. But next, I ought to remember that my opinion is not authoritative. My opinion is not law. My opinion is exactly that, mine. Now my brother over here, David, likes coffee. And I like coffee. But David likes strange coffee. He likes that flavored stuff in his coffee. And that's just wrong. All I want in my coffee is coffee. But you know what? What he does with his coffee is his business. I don't have to drink it, so I don't care what he puts in it as long as it's legal, as long as it's not alcoholic. And he doesn't do that. My opinion is mine. Exactly that. Nothing more. Your opinion is yours. Nothing more. And what that means is that we need to be careful to remember that God's word the doctrine here towers over our opinions in terms of its authority. Do you remember the words of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12? Flip a couple of pages. Go over there to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 and remind yourself there what the, what the inspired writer says about this word. He tells us about the Bible, the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And it is a discerner, it's a measurer of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There are some qualities here in the Word of God that my opinion simply doesn't possess. What I think and what I feel on any given subject is neither breathed out by God nor is it necessarily even profitable. What you think, what you feel, God didn't establish that. He didn't breathe that out. That's just your opinion. It may be profitable, it may not. It's just your opinion. But God's word is profitable. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and what do you find in verses 16 and 17? You know the passages, don't you? All scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable. Everything God says is useful. Everything God says is helpful. Everything God says is beneficial. All scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly or completely furnished unto every good work. David Hopkins, what I have to tell you, in my opinion, might be useful to you and it might not. See, David's a Boy Scout. He's a Boy Scout leader. He was an Eagle Scout. I was not. But I was a scout before he was. I might actually know something that would be useful. But then again, he probably knows way more about things like that than I do. He went farther than I did. My opinion, my thoughts, might be utterly useless to him. But God's are not. God's thoughts, if you will, are profitable. They're useful. They're beneficial in every way. Too many times, though, what do we do? 
We let what we think, we let what we feel take precedence. We let it outrank what the Bible says. But that should never happen. You see, my opinion is not authoritative. It doesn't have any force behind it. Now, it's true that a well-informed, carefully considered opinion sometimes can and once in a while actually does have some value. And when it does, we ought to reasonably consider it. But even when it does, it's because it's educated in this. God's Word. What you or I think about any subject should always be subject to and measured against the authority of the Scripture. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 4, go down to verse 11, Peter's very plain, very direct, when he writes, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Let him speak according to what God says. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. When I insist on my opinion, when I try to put my preferences across, who's trying to get the glory? me but Peter says that's not what this is about we should speak we should act according to what God directs so that he gets the glory after all he's the one that made all things and his word is the one that counts but a third thing that I want you to consider just for a minute we all have opinions we all have our ideas and our preferences, our thoughts, our feelings about different things. They should not be considered authoritative. They're not equal in authority to the Word of God. And what that means is I must never, never let what I think, let what I feel cause division in the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul instructed the Corinthians saying, beware, be careful, lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, if memory serves me. Don't let this opinion, this, this preference, this liberty of yours cause a problem in the church. God does grant us liberty in matters of, of opinion, matters of judgment. Maybe you'd prefer that we meet at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday instead of 9 o'clock in the morning. Neither time is exclusively right or wrong. We could just as well do one as the other. It's a matter of opinion. But God does not allow our liberty to choose this time or that time to become a knife to cut up somebody that disagrees with us. We might have, you and I might have very strong feelings about something. Very strong opinions. Might be very strong opposing opinions. And we might disagree. We might even disagree loudly. Just go to Ray and Tina's on Super Bowl Sunday and watch the Patriots and the Falcons and imagine if Larry Rose is there. 
it might get a little loud. But those opinions, those feelings must never be allowed to be a point of contention, a challenge to fellowship in the congregation. They must never be allowed to hinder our fellowship, our work, and our worship. What this means is that I have to be humble enough. Each one of us has to be humble enough to recognize that not everybody's going to agree with my opinion. And when folks disagree with my opinion, I need to back down if that opinion's in the way of our fellowship. Because what we have in Christ is far more important than whether I think that you drive the right kind of car or not. Whether I think that you ought to park on the north side or the south side of the church building. That doesn't matter, does it? Take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 14. And what do you find in verse 19? In Romans chapter 14, in verse 19, the Apostle Paul instructed those Christians, Therefore, let us pursue. Carson, what does pursue mean? To pursue something means to chase after it, doesn't it? Let us chase after those things that that make for peace and things wherewith we may edify one another. Turn a couple of pages to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3, and there you find Paul saying, Endeavor, work hard, try to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. But you know what? There's no way I can fulfill that instruction if every time my opinion, (laughs) pardon me, I feel better now. There's no way that I can fulfill that instruction if every time somebody disagrees with my opinion, I get mad. There's no way that I can keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace if every time somebody disagrees with me, I'm just going to throw up my hands and pick up my toys and go home because I didn't get my way. You see, those things cannot be allowed to stand in the way of our fellowship, our work, our worship. Now, if you go back and, and study religious history in this country and in Western Europe, you find that about 200 years ago, there was a movement very prominent in this country in the religious community to just throw away all of the trappings and the creeds and the doctrines and the practices of that denomination and that one and that one and that one and that one and just take this. Go back to the Bible and just be what you read about there. There were a lot of folks that looked around and said, we don't agree in religious things and that's clearly not what Jesus prayed for. He prayed that we may all be one, John 17, We just go back to the Bible and let the Bible be our guide. And out of that movement, out of that sentiment, came a a statement, a slogan, a, a philosophy, if you will, on a practical level that said, in matters of faith, unity. In matters of opinion, liberty. In all things, charity, which is the King James word for love. In matters of faith, in things where God has said what to do, we need to be united. In matters of opinion, in matters where God has said, in in essence, you can do what you please. You can choose what time you meet on Sunday. You can choose whether you meet under a tree or in a church building. You can choose whether you use songs on a screen or songs in a book. Our songs learned from memory. In all of those things, liberty. You can do whichever one suits you. But in all things, love. Kept within a biblical context, that idea 
in matters of faith, unity. In matters of opinion, liberty. In all things, charity. Keep that within the context of the Bible, and that's a perfect description of how each of us ought to view our own opinions and feelings. They can never be allowed to rise to the status of doctrine, to be so important that I'm willing to let them cause a problem between brethren because I want to have my way. It's not my way or the highway. It's God's way or no way. And God's word, not what I think, not what you think, God's word establishes what's necessary for any person and for every person to do to receive the blessings, the promises that he offers the forgiveness of our sins, the hope of an eternal home in heaven with him. And it's his word that says that when we hear it and understand it, we need to believe it. It's his word that says that we need to repent of sins and not walk in the sinful ways of the world anymore. It's his word. It's not a formula that somebody got together and dreamed up or voted on years ago. It's what the Bible says that we need to confess our faith in Jesus Christ. Remember what Paul wrote in Romans 10, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's not our tradition or my opinion or something that we chose. It's what the Bible says, that when we come to that point, we need to be baptized into Christ. Not into the church of Christ in the denominational sense, but into Christ, into the body of Christ for the forgiveness of sins and then walk in newness of life. You see, these things are not matters of opinion. They're matters of doctrine because they're what God said. We have the privilege to repeat them. But God's word always, always, always outweighs what any of us think or want or feel. And so God has said, here's how you obtain salvation. Here's what you do to keep it. You walk uprightly. You, you live righteously. You repent when you go astray and you come home and you ask forgiveness. But you don't let these things divide you from each other because if you do, they'll divide you from me. God's word is the authority. Our opinion never is. Let's keep the two separate and walk in his way. If you need to answer the gospel's invitation now, Charles is going to come. We're going to stand together. He'll lead us while we sing. We want to encourage you. If we can assist you, if we can help you in some way, if we can serve you in some way, if you'd like to be identified with the, the congregation here and work under the oversight of godly, faithful elders, just like the biblical pattern establishes, we want you to know it's a convenient time to, to express that desire. We can help and serve in some way. Come now. Let's stand together and sing.
time. Listen, if you do not have a chance to partake of the Lord's Supper, it's been prepared. If you turn your song books over a few pages, number 784, 784. We'll sing the first verse. If you make your way to the first couple of pews, you'll be served. 784. What did I say? Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine. We're thankful for your son who died on the cross for our sins. Heavenly Father, when we do this, we are reminding or mindful of the sacrifice that was made for us. And for that, we're ever grateful. We ask and pray that we do this in a way that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. continue in prayer. Lord, we find this convenient time to gather together to collect the funds needed to, to continue your work on this earth. Lord, we ask that you bless the giver as well as the gift and those that administer unto it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let's stand at this time. Do we have any other final announcements to either be made from our elders or anything? We'll close our service with number hymn number 743. Number 743. O land of rest for thee, I sigh when will the moment come. When shall I lay my armor by and dwell in peace and hope? Will work till Jesus comes, will work till Jesus comes, will work till Jesus comes and will be gathered home. I saw that one my Savior said no more my step shall roam with him I'll bring this chilly tide and reach my heavenly home will work till Jesus comes will work till Jesus comes will work till Jesus comes God, thank you for all the blessings you've given us. Help us to have a good new week. Help us to do good for the people around us and be good servants. Look into our hearts and hear our prayers. Give us strength and help the people around us to be happy. Give us wisdom to know to be able to keep our opinions in the right place and more wisdom still to go by your, your, the logic of your word instead of what our feelings are. Help us to have a good new week. In Jesus' name, amen.